and welcome to the How We Do Digital Ministry podcast, sponsored by Faith Growth. I'm your host, Charlotte Elia, and on this podcast, we talk to leaders who are out in the world engaging folks through digital ministry or helping folks engage others through digital ministry. Today, I'm delighted to have with me Ryan Panzer. Ryan is the author of Grace and Gigabytes, Being Church in a Tech-Shaped Culture, And his forthcoming book is titled The Holy and the Hybrid, Navigating the Church's Digital Reformation. Ryan, you've been on this podcast before. Welcome back. Thanks Um, so much, Charlotte. It's so great to be here today. Yeah, um, I'm delighted to um, have gotten to uh, flip through this book and uh, already take in some of your insights. So excited to hear what you have to share today. Um, So Tell us what's on your mind. What's what brought this book about? What's going on? So this this book was largely a, a response to a question I continued to hear throughout 2020 and 2021, which was, "What are we going to do with all of this digital church stuff that we figured out during the pandemic? Are we just going to walk away from this? Uh, are we going to somehow find a way to make it sustainable? You know, what's going to happen to everything we've learned in in these last couple of years?" And as I engaged that conversation and talked to church leaders, I, I formed the idea for this book, which is really to think about the, the, the hybrid moment the church finds itself in, where we feel this sense that our communities have become increasingly distributed uh, across a local community and also a digital landscape. And so I wrote this book to help make church, uh, help church leaders make sense of that moment, uh, to make sense of the, the technology of that moment and also the change management practices, mm. recognizing that this is a, a transition of the magnitude that the church has hardly seen in its history. Mm. And speaking of that transition, you, uh, you bring up early in the book and then throughout this, the events of Friday, March 13th, 2020, uh, and that following weekend. And for me, I almost found some of that nauseating <laughs> in a way to relive it and that yeah. whirlwind around it. So I wonder if, if I mean, just, and, and you, you say, I, I think something about feeling even disoriented by the magnitude of change yeah. that occurred then. Yeah. And so I, I, I found myself on Friday, March 13th, 2020, uh, actually driving to a, a, to a funeral service, to a memorial service. And uh, it, it was, it was for my grandmother actually. And uh, just, a, just a wonderful, wonderful presence in my life, uh, so important in bringing me up in, in the church. And uh, we gathered in this kind of stately Episcopal church in Wapaka, Wisconsin, a small town in central Wisconsin, and where we had expected this elbow-to-elbow jam-packed memorial service, we only had uh, you know, close family and, and a few friends, and everyone else had you know, seen the news headlines and, and decided to remain home. So mm. there were discussions about what, what should we do with communion? What, it, what do we do with, um, with the offering plates? And little did we know that those questions were just the tip of the iceberg, that there would be so many questions we'd have to ask ourselves in the next three days and, and in the weeks to come. And so, yeah, I begin the book specifically with my experience of, of that weekend. And it ends with a, a bike ride that I took uh, around some of the, the, the large churches here on the, the west side of Madison, Wisconsin, and just how eerie it was to see the empty parking lots, uh, the cars driving around the parking lots, trying to figure out why the doors were locked, mm-hmm. and just the sense of, of disorientation that occurred that weekend. Uh, now, that's not where the book ends, of course. That's the starting point. My hope is that uh, through the, the stories and the practices and the questions I ask through the book, to help the reader uh, maybe move from a sense of, of digital disorientation to uh, a place where we at least know uh, kind of where we might go next, uh, at least in broad brush strokes, and to feel like where we're headed is um, somewhat positive, somewhat purposeful, and also somewhat sustainable. Mm, yeah. You point out during that uh, weekend too, uh, I think it's up being a great background for the rest of the book and the fact that you say, this is a quote, sort of, I don't think about the technical glitches and hiccups and the production quality from that, those first attempts that we were making, right? Yeah. I think about the agility that faith leaders demonstrated, the innovation that we practiced. I think about how committed we were to learning and to leading. 
And I, I felt like, well, it's so important. And I, I feel like I can't get enough of reminding people of all these, this huge thing that they accomplished largely in, in this short period of time, but how that ties in, I think with um, maybe this broader argument you make about wanting folks to embrace the values of digital age culture rather than particular technologies. Can you say something about what you mean by that? Exactly. So I, I really have this strong conviction that ministry in a digital age uh, is for the low tech and the high tech alike. You don't need to have a large media budget to do great digital ministry. In fact, I think sometimes the smaller congregations may even find themselves at an, adva- at an advantage in this digital age uh, because they can build more interactivity and collaboration in worship services and events. And that, that's a pretty cool thing with what you can do, all you can do via Zoom. Uh, but, but what I'm ultimately getting at with both of my books really is that uh, the digital age is perhaps best understood not through the apps and technologies that come and go, but uh, through some of the the prevailing themes and the, the values that you'll find within our culture. Uh, there's an increased desire to want to connect in many different ways, online and offline, synchronously and asynchronously. Uh, to collaborate, um, to to have experiences that are more conversational rather than consumption focused, and to learn in ways that allow us to uh, create and really express uh, the contours of our unique faith journeys uh, rather than just to um, to sit and listen. So a lot of my work looks at some of these values we find within the digital age, how church can make sense of those values, and that's a that's a process that you can engage whether you're a staff of one in a rural parish with no Wi-Fi to speak of, or whether you find yourself at a, at a urban mega church with a staff of dozens and a media budget in the thousands. For sure. What, what would you say, you know, at this, this moment, as you say, everyone, our church is trying to na- navigate what to do next, what to do with their digital material. Uh, is one message that you really think needs to get out there that pastors, leaders need to focus on? Well, I think we need to start asking our question, ourselves the question of, of how do we get to know the neighbors that we never see? Mm. And what I mean by that is there have been some statistics about who's really watching online worship or participating in online worship. And what's surprising when you look at those stats from places like Christianity Today and Pew Research is it's not who we might expect. It's not always those who are active churchgoers, active members of our congregation who would just prefer to to worship online. Uh, In fact, the early data from Pew tells us that only about one in 10 active churchgoers plan to remain online once it was safe to return to the Mm -hmm. building. Mm -hmm. Now, there's all this data about uh, what I refer to as digital church hopping where people are increasingly visiting many different congregations, streaming different sermons, streaming different parts of the service, uh, even uh, worshiping across different localities. Uh, And so we we have to think about how we might get to know the neighbor uh, that we might not ever see take a step inside our doorway. And I think that that's a very different question than the one a few church leaders are asking right now, which is just how do we get people to come back to, to the building? Mm -hmm. So there's some, there's some guideposts in the book that speak to that question, but one practice that I would recommend is simply mapping out what are all of the different pathways to involvement in your ministry that exists in this new digital normal. We know uh, from, from the data that most church traffic comes from search engines and not from, uh, not from social media. Uh, how does your church website uh, show up on search pages? Uh, we know that uh, the content we place on on blogs, on our website, and also on social media is really important to helping people to make a decision about whether to uh, whether to join us for worship. Uh, what does that invitation look like, and, and and how does it appear to somebody who's who's church hopping and may not even be, you know, uh, proximate to us in in terms of our neighborhood? So. Think about mapping out all of these different touch points you have in your pathway to involvement within your ministry, and then maybe select one of those to focus on and really think about improving and optimizing as we continue to navigate this this new hybrid landscape of church. What what does that what would that look like? 
well, what might that look like? Well, so one, one thing that I've been thinking about is how uh, when you uh, attend worship online, uh, oftentimes churches will say, uh, if you're new, fill out a contact card or mm-hmm. uh, submit this form to to contact the pastor. And sometimes maybe they'll throw up a, a throw throw out a QR code on the screen and say, scan this QR code or or fill out this form at this link shortener link. All of those are really good tactics. But I think what maybe it might be missing uh, from that is some kind of a, of a reason to uh, fill out the form, a reason to get involved. Are you going to send them a new member information kit? Do you have a visitor gift that, that you'll send? Uh, are you going to um, invite them to share their prayer requests with you so they can be shared with the broader community in the newsletter? In some ways, this is about thinking less about how we can get people to respond to uh, to forms and to information capture uh, efforts on the web, and more about explaining, you know, here is what you can get out of a relationship with this ministry, and here's how we'll pray for you and support you as you take your next step in discernment about whether this might be a, a congregation for you to call home. Thank you. That's really that's really helpful. I appreciate that. You uh, also note in the book, um, sort of, however our hybrid feature unfolds, we're called to preserve this a front row experience for those gathered online. And it's I know this is important enough because it's it's the the cover art of the book really has this wonderful illustration of this. What what is a front row experience for those? Well, online? maybe to maybe to define the front row experience, you have to start by defining the back row experience. Great. And so before the pandemic started, some churches were doing a little bit on Facebook Live, and uh, maybe they had a a camera at the back of the balcony. Uh, perhaps a youth volunteer was controlling it, and so you, you saw the 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 sanctuary, but most of what you saw was the back of a lot of heads as you were worshiping mm-hmm. online. What we think about with a front row experience is the exact opposite of that, where rather than feeling like you're on the outside looking in, you feel like you're sitting front and center in 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 the sanctuary. Now, I'm a Lutheran, and the thought of sitting in the front row um, is frightening to people like uh, like me who have been raised to sit in the back row, uh, especially when it comes to bringing our little kids to church. But let's think about like what it, what it would it take to make it feel like you were sitting in the middle. Of, of that sanctuary. Uh, well, you'd probably have a way to greet those around you. Uh, you'd probably have a way to, um, to somehow pass the peace during that aspect of the liturgy. You'd feel like you were in some way involved during um, some of the aspects of, of the congregational, of the worship that maybe don't translate that well online. I'm thinking mm-hmm. about uh, communion here, for example. Mm-hmm. So it's about thinking about how we can not just create a, a passive viewership experience, but really create some collaborative opportunities within the liturgy uh, so that those online can, can truly be uh, heard and known. Can you, can you give me an example of a collaborative opportunity, something on your mind to share? Well, let, let, let me give you one uh, really low tech example, which is sure. prayer requests. And, mm, and a lot of people uh-huh. think about, uh, you know, how do I take in prayer requests during the worship service? But you can do this through, throughout the week. Uh, set up a, a text message number where uh, if somebody has a prayer request they want read aloud, uh, they can text it into the pastor. So when it comes to the prayers of the people, those requests are, 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 are lifted up. If you wanted to get really high tech with it, uh, you can even use the same types of software that conferences use to project uh, uh, tweets and other social media posts throughout the week. So if somebody wants to tweet or Snapchat or Facebook post in a prayer request, uh, that can be shown as part of the, the, the worship feed. There's all kinds of low tech and high tech ideas, but uh, when it comes to those opportunities to collaborate and, and get involved, I would start by thinking about prayer requests. I would start by thinking about um, how you can uh, name opportunities for digital involvement through through the announcements. And perhaps most importantly, I would look at what words of greeting and welcome you're using mm-hmm. uh, so that when it comes to speaking to those gathered online, they, they really feel like they're welcomed in an important part of the, the worshiping community. Mm. Excellent. Thank you. Is your church website a mess? It could be difficult to navigate or doesn't represent you well. You want your site to be more than just an online brochure, but you don't know how to make that happen. Imagine 
having a beautiful, easy to use website for your church that helps people find the information they need about your church and its ministries quickly and easily. Faith Growth will build a beautiful, effective, user-friendly website for your church in as little as four weeks. Our process includes everything from a free initial consultation to the full setup and training so you can grow your digital presence and reach your community. Schedule a consultation at faithgrowth.com or, if you're not ready yet, get your free guide explaining the process to get a website that reaches people and gets results by going to faithgrowth.com slash guide. What, are there major misconceptions you see out there, things that pastors, other leaders are talking about that they think are going to happen that you and your research just, it's not, doesn't look, doesn't look the same to you? Well, I, I, I don't know if it's a misconception, but I still think there's a perception out there that the right thing to do is to bring those people uh, who once were with us in person and bring them back to the worshiping community as it existed in March, 2020. There's, there's a lot of comparisons that look at attendance now versus attendance on March 8th, 2020. And what the, what the sociological data tells us is that no matter what our individual congregations may attempt to do, that's going to be a very difficult challenge to confront. Uh, Christianity today tells us that during 2020 and 2021, the percentage of active churchgoers in the United States dropped from 34% to 28%. So one in five active churchgoers just stopped going to church altogether. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, it doesn't matter how many phone calls we make or, or how many emails we send. A lot of those members just aren't going to come back because of the new routines they've established, the new habits that they've fallen into on Sunday mornings, and just the fact that they don't see uh, where church fits within uh, a very different lifestyle than than they were living two years ago. So I, I think the opportunity is less about how do we bring those people back and more about how do we strengthen the connections that we have. Uh, are there people who are worshiping online who can't be present in our sanctuary? And can we visit them more often or bring them communion more frequently at home? Uh, are there people online who want to go deeper into some of the themes from, from liturgy and preaching? And can we create digital content that helps them to explore those questions? Uh, I think this is a question not of breadth and increasing our numbers, but of depth and thinking about the community as it is now and, and how that community uh, might have different needs from, from the one that was gathered in 2020. Excellent. Do you, you use the language in the book of a digital church and analog church? And I, I appreciate that because I think a lot of conversations, we struggle with what to call you know, in person, or, I mean, I still hear people call uh, back to the comments you just made sort of real church <laughs> and online church sort of thing. So I, I wonder if you can say something more about how those are related or um, what you're thinking around that. So the book begins with a description of what I refer to as the analog church. A lot of people have called it the analog church. And that, that's simply the, the church that was defined by a neighborhood-based, synchronous building-based presence. You gathered together at one time and place, and that was the, the location of church community. The digital or the the, the, the hybrid church, what we're becoming is a hybrid of online and offline, but it's also a hybrid of asynchronous and synchronous. It's a combination of people who gather at the same time or at different times. And so when I talk about the digital reformation in the book title and throughout the book, what I'm trying to build on is the idea that was first proposed by Dr. Elizabeth Drescher. And that's the idea that there's this remaking of the sense of placefulness of of, of church community. And that digital community is becoming a true ministry site. Uh, it's not less than our physical church buildings. It's just different. It's, a, it's an accompaniment to uh, what happens w- with, within our buildings. Mm-hmm. So w- when we think about analog, when we think about digital, when we think about hybrid, 
uh, we're thinking about very different models of, of, of church and simply trying to go back to the analog church with a couple of digital add-ons is likely to prove frustrating in the years ahead. We, okay, so in the practicalities here of some of this, um, in your mind, trying to really make these things work and to make them work well, is this something that you think, uh, you know, cur- people who have been currently trained in seminary uh, can do by adding a couple hours or carving out their time differently? Or should we be creating sort of new positions within congregations that are more devoted to the digital church? What, what do you think there? So I, first of all, I, I would think uh, very carefully about what, how hybrid doesn't mean everything is online and offline always at the same time. Mm-hmm. It's okay for aspects of your ministry to be all offline or even all online. Uh, last night, I was uh, I was attending worship in the park with my congregation. I was actually uh, preaching it last night at this church in in Wisconsin, and uh, you know we didn't stream that online be, right. because it's it takes place in a park. It's this very communal outdoor setting. It doesn't translate to to YouTube, and you know we we could have brought the cameras and the microphones off. We we, we have the equipment for it, but it just didn't make much sense. Uh, similarly, we've seen book discussions that we've tried to move. Uh, to uh, face-to-face venues and our, att- our attendance dwindles and uh, they, they lose momentum. So we found that certain book discussions have worked better uh, keeping them on Zoom, even though we have the ability to gather in person. So before you think about, do I add more hours? Do I add more staff? Do I you know, do this and that? I would think about what are the moments that make most sense online? What are the moments that make most sense entirely offline? And where do we want to blend those together. Uh, For many churches, that involves taking a look at Sunday morning and thinking about if there's one church service uh, that makes more sense for the online worshiper, Uh, perhaps it's the more um, more contemporary or even the more traditional service. Uh, Maybe some services aren't going to be streamed uh, online. And then once you've had that figured out, once you've had those conversations, uh, it, it's a matter of thinking about, well, are we going to build staffing structures and resources or are we going to invest in technologies that uh, make this work easier or even allow us to introduce some, some automation? So there are many ways to I- explore these questions. We don't need to jump immediately into, I need to invest more resources and I need to hire more staff. In many ways, those are the questions that come last after we've gone through this intentional work of, of conversation and planning. Sure. <laughs> no, that's, I so appreciate you laying that out that way. I, I'm encountering more and more people who want to hire folks for work that they don't know what the work is <laughs> yet. So that's really helpful. <laughs> that assessment. Yeah. In, in, the, in the design world, we know we, we refer to that as solutioning. You know, you have an idea for what you want to roll out, but you don't really know what problem it solves. So you're effectively designing for nothing. And we know that designs for, for, for nothing uh, don't go anywhere in, in the long run. So uh, this is a good moment uh, for today's church leader to um, perhaps read some of the, the good work of, of IDEO. They're a design uh, research institute on the West Coast. They have a lot of resources just about, you know, how do you design problems to difficult, uh, to, I'm sorry, how do you design solutions to difficult problems that don't have easy answers? Mm-hmm. Uh, it, there's a lot of thought from the, the world of design that uh, when, when translated with some, some um, theological foundations actually holds up cr- quite well. And this is a really interesting time to study some of those ideas because they can, they can do a lot of good in the world of church right now. Excellent. I so appreciate you bringing all of that, all of your background uh, and sharing it with us in the, in the church world here. Uh, so we're almost out of time. So I'm wondering, we're going to leave the floor open for you for some final thoughts, things you really want to get out there. The, the prevailing fears or anxieties of, of today's church leaders seems to be, seem to be in part about uh, uh, attendance and in part about uh, feasibility or mm. uh, making all of this work sustainable. And those are two uh, extremely difficult questions that defy easy answers and call for, you know, really some creative uh, design thinking and, um, and ideation. Uh, 
So this is a really good opportunity if you haven't yet done so to make sure you have a mentor or a coach who can accompany you through these times. Uh, we've, we've seen the studies on ministry and church leader burnout being at an all time high. So, you know, in addition to learning and, and seeking to get more information on all of these topics, just be sure to care for yourself, to give yourself the grace to step back and unplug, to take frequent digital Sabbaths, and to remember that this is going to be a, a years long process of exploration and growth. We don't need to do all things at all times right now. That's a wonderful blessing for us to end on. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you again for talking with us and um, for sharing this book. This book is uh, to come out in September. Is that right? That's right. Um, so the, the, the Holy and the Hybrid, Navigating the Church's Digital Reformation uh, comes out September 27th from Fortress Press. And is in pre-orders now. Just go ahead and do it. Just go ahead and do it. Then you get a surprise at your let, door, right? And let me know what you think. You know, my website is ryanpanzer.com. Uh, come send me a note. Uh, I'd love to hear what your what your thoughts are. Uh, for good, for bad, uh, let me know. I, I look forward to being in conversation with you. Oh, I so appreciate that. Uh, thanks again, Ryan. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, we want to invite everyone uh, listening to join our private Facebook group, How We Do Digital Ministry. That link will be in the show notes, um, as well as the link to Ryan's page where you can find him. Um, but our private Facebook group is a great place to share uh, and join with colleagues to discuss all things digital ministry in the moments when you're not listening to this podcast or re re reading one of Ryan's books. Uh, but until next week, peace and blessings to you all. Mm -hmm.